See, this is what I was thinking was going to happen. If we started podcasting in a car, we are going to get off track or lost. So now we've been righted. We're on the way to the highway. We've got Ari Gold, the director of Song of Sway Lake, and brother Ethan Gold, the composer of the film. So... What started first, the song or the the screenplay? Um, the 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 film was actually already shot and partway through the editing process when mm-hmm. I wrote the song. Um, initially, the song that that was playing in the key in that key moment in the film, uh, there's a reveal of a of a vinyl album that has the characters have been searching for. It originally was a Cole Porter um, mm-hmm. sung by a guy called Hutch, who's who was, I think, somewhat famous in the 30s and mm-hmm. has faded into history a bit, but was allegedly the lover of various people in the royal family, as well as Cole Porter, as well as uh, women and men. And he was a from somewhere in the Caribbean. I think he was from Trinidad. Trinidad. Yeah, I forget. He was a, he was a Caribbean... Um, you know, of African extraction, I guess we say African Caribbean, uh-huh. not African American, but um, yeah. So he was kind of a um, racy figure of the time, um, with a wonderful voice, and that was somewhat the inspiration for uh, 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 some of the spirit of it. But um, I uh, suggested that having an original song for. A small film would be a, a good thing creatively and mm-hmm. frankly strategically also um, so uh, then wrote a bunch of different songs and it was also kind of working on the score at the time and I, I'm very much a fan of uh, limiting the themes the, the number of kind of musical themes and really kind of creating certain little yeah. melodies that play through a film so I wanted so I presented a bunch of score material as well as songs, and we made a decision of one that would kind of uh, that Ari and his editor at the time liked best as you know uh, working with the tones that they were going for emotionally. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, that's that's when it came in. There's I could go on, but so what are you, you're saying is is that uh, I'm talking a little louder than normal because I want you to be able to hear me you're in front of me uh, uh, and that is that this you you composed the song the theme song essentially but all you took parts of it parts of the melody were used throughout the score of the film as well like throughout the film that's right yeah okay. um, it went sort of so both. they were familiar it went both directions yeah when I was I was already developing the score when I wrote the songs and so uh, actually if we want to get really technical some of the main it's not really a verse chorus verse type song but the kind of main section of the song uh, I mm-hmm. developed after uh, writing what they chose as one of their favorite themes for the score so then I wrote lyrics to go with that um, and then developed a bridge section and then the bridge section then informed other things that went into the score so it kind of went both directions which is, I think, appropriate because uh, I really just wanted to make sure they were. It was fully inter- the song, which doesn't play till you know the f- the last act of the film. In, well, it actually plays in an earlier form. It plays. There's the the main song, "Song of Soy Lake." There's two versions of it. In other words, right? There's like the I don't know popular version that's used that's to right. kind of promote the the actual uh, resort Sway Lake. Yeah. Well, the the way that the way this story is kind of told. Um, there was a song uh, written by this this composer who was staying at the family's house uh, in at their wedding uh, in the late 30s, and he made a kind of secret recording of 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 this song. Left, uh, sorry, I'm giving directions to my brother while he drives. Um, and uh, but then it became a big hit in the after the war as a kind of razzle dazzle big band Andrews Sisters. Uh, essentially, right. yes, it's yeah. essentially like I was doing an Andrew Sisters thing. Uh-huh. So during the course of the plot, these young 
young men uh, in the early 90s <laughs> where it, when the film is set are looking for the secret recording that was made and given to uh, one of the kids' grandparents on their wedding day and was, was a kind of private right. recording of this song that became a big hit later. Um, and so, uh, and that version was... Uh, um, but that's the big reveal, and uh, yeah. you know, musically in the in the film, it's when that that secret recording finally gets found and played. Play, played, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I will. I will ahead. say, by the way, that uh, those were the 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 razzle dazzle song. I had a band called the Staves, which is also oh, three si- yeah three sisters, uh, which yeah. was perfect. So. The Andrews sisters, having been three sisters, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we got the staves uh, oh. in London to sing, uh, oh, you know, those tight three-part harmonies. And um, the quiet uh, composer's home recording ver- version, which is like a sort of small jazz combo, uh-huh. was sung by a wonderful singer uh, named John Grant, who's an American uh, who's very well-known in in. Europe and the UK and lives actually in Iceland so I flew to Iceland to record his vocal um, all the all the tracking for the for the backing stuff was recorded in New York um, arranged by Gina Leish- Leishman um, wonderfully arranged and so then we I was bouncing around the globe to get the uh, the vocalists um, so it was quite a thing to get but as people see the film I this has been a consistent thing that they don't realize that it's uh, original music. Um, mm-hmm. So it was, I know my brother, who's driving next to me, was v- extremely concerned to uh, make sure it sounded authentic. Authentic, and yeah. A yeah. lot of... Th- yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah. just, yeah. you know, there's a lot of bands doing a sort of old-time thing, various types of old-time st- stuff now, but you hear and it doesn't really sound like that era Mm. Um, and so it was an interesting it was quite challenging frankly to get it right Uh, not just the arrangement but the way it was recorded and um, when you hear those old recordings they don't sound very good so it was kind Mm -hmm. of a thing of like I wanted to walk a line between authenticity and also um, I wanted it to be rich as as an experience so if I actually just kind of made a recording and you know, rolled, made the lim- put the EQ into this kind of honky register and left it at that. It sort of sounds old, but doesn't f- really sound good. Mm-hmm. Or, or, and so I think we achieved. Uh, people have been. I mean, consistently, people don't realize that it's that's a that that's original music. Right, which means you did the job right. <laughs> yeah, ironically, yeah, it, it does. Yeah. It does. Um, even uh, though now you have to kind of argue for nobody's going to believe you <laughs> trying to right. say no 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 it's a new song I swear I just made it sound old and I made it sound old on. and I'm like competing with Cole Porter you know yeah. so yeah. Uh, I but I, I I'm I'm very glad that people but don't you, realize it because I was f- for the uh, for the kind of sense the of the, the film that Ari wanted to create of a real experience and right. a real lake and they're really looking for this yeah. thing it needed to to really be convincing and it yeah. is well I, what it, what's compelling about one of the things that's com- most compelling about the film is that through the narrative Ari and you musically are are tapping into this mythology you know from the past and trying to get at something you know in your own, both though, together you created this uh, you know way of doing it I'm going to do maybe a poor job of describing the film, the st- backstory, but which you sort of started talking about it. Yeah, go ahead. Which is about a young guy who is the in the fam- the family that owns this resort up in the Adirondacks, right? I mean, it, it's essentially, yeah, they own they own in the story they own the lake and they have yeah. this beautiful house. Yeah, he's the he's the scion. Well, he's. Kind of two generations down from mm-hmm. glory, his his father, um, who's you know the, the the son of of these grand, essentially American aristocrats, has kind of was a bit of a failure and killed himself on the okay. lake. Right, right. And right. so but the grandson uh, brings his is also kind of a bit of a a jlub or whatever you know. It's just a, a kind of a depressed uh, yeah. young man, um, melancholic. 
Sorry? Maybe mel- melancholic, whatever. A melancholic whatever the term. Yeah. young man. That's mm-hmm. played by Ro- Rory Culkin. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, he, Who himself seems to be a melancholic. Rory. Yeah, but uh, it's okay. Uh, we don't have to. Uh, yeah, I, 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 don't. I might agree, but I only have met him a few times, so um, who knows? Um, but he, we, he was at the Woodstock Film Festival with us yesterday. Yes. Very nice to, to hang out with him. Um, and uh, he's he, so his he goes up there with his Russian buddy, who's played by Robbie he, Robbie Sheehan, who's uh, who's Irish, not Russian, as you may have guessed from the name. Um, and so he's pretty. It's, oh, so the character's Russian. The character's Russian, and, and he's, but it's an Irish actor. Irish actor named uh-huh. Ro- Robert okay. Sheehan. Okay. We call him Robbie Sheehan. Uh-huh. He's professionally is he known as Robbie or Ro- Robert? I forget. I'm handing the mic to Ari here. Should I be doing the Albanian accent when I speak? Eh, it's okay as long as people. Uh, we'll, we'll 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 help navigate. Yeah. So, well, Robert Sheehan um, was the only person that mm-hmm. we considered for the role that had. By the way, the, sorry to cut you off. I think we, let's just finish describing the plot so we don't throw people too. No, because we were sort of halfway through the basic setup. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just to quickly contextualize for the listeners. Uh, so these two young men go up to uh, to, the, to, to the Rory lake Culkin's house. character's yeah. grandmother's lake house uh, with the intention, in a way, the main intention um, is to steal, to find, and then steal this uh, valuable one of a kind reco- uh, p- piece of vinyl that they know about uh, that was recorded by. Uh, a composer and given to the it's grandparents. Old seventy eight, old seventy eight, and uh, so right. they're going up in the in the summertime to find this record and steal it, and and but essentially it becomes a story of of uh, facing how to how to confront the past, how to let the past go, um, and metaphorically that's expressed through this obsession with old music. Um, the grandmother shows up, surprises them up there, and and it turns into a kind of a a summer, in a way, a bit of a spiritual coming of age for all of the characters, um, and some interesting relationships develop right. uh, with people yeah. on the lake as well as between the grandmother and and the boys, which I guess maybe we'll leave to yeah, the yeah, viewers. Sure. Of course. Um, anyway, Ari was beginning to talk about Robert Sheehan, uh, the Irish, uh, wonderful young Irish actor who plays the Russian uh, Nikolai. Ari, I, he's also behind the wheel, so I'm going to talk a little more so that this is Ethan, or just keep him yeah, focused but, on the road. Uh, All right. We have an open road ahead. It's, yeah, it's so, Ari, why don't you talk about uh, Robbie Sheehan? Well, um, yeah, casting the film is interesting, and casting any movie, you, you're you putting together a different mm-hmm. soup every time, and the ingredients are different, and the carrots and the celery have to somehow mix, even if they're quite different. And Rory Culkin is a very um, intense and internal type of actor, uh, matches his personality, which uh, I don't think is melancholic. He just uh, he's, um, keeps things to himself in a way that's quite nice to work with on screen because so much of what he keeps inside actually shows on his face and seeing the film on the big screen people really respond to this character who is in the aftermath of his father's suicide trying to fix things by stealing a record from his grandmother that he thinks he should have inherited and that he thinks somehow will save his soul if he can just have yeah, it right this record that was the kind of crown jewel of his family's illustrious history and bringing a wildly different rambunctious Russian friend up to the palatial estate on the lake to try to find this record is a sign that he's at least willing to imagine having a good life which his father failed to do Um, so we needed for the Russian to have someone who really was full of life full of humor full of a kind of strong sexual charisma because he's basically seducing everybody on the lake um, including the grandmother at least Um, I won't give away too much but the grandmother and the Russian 
develop a mutual admiration. I'll say that. A connection. Yes. But to mention her name because uh, she's actually, even though she's an older woman, she's still has the sensuality of a, you know, of a young woman. Yeah, it, for me, in, in some ways, the Charlie Sway character is the heart of the film. Mm-hmm. She's That's the grandmother played by Mary Beth Peel. Yeah, she's in her 70s. She's gorgeous. She had glory years with Commander Houseway, who was a war hero and piano player back in the uh, 40s and 50s. And they raised a son who Mm -hmm. couldn't live up to them. And the son had a son who was played by Rory Culkin, who is still living under this shadow of a family that was wealthy and heroic right. and um, well, un- well, right. toppable. It, right, whose glory days are well behind them. So yeah. uh, she she carries that the past in her and remembers the real thing but these two young men have uh, weren't there for the 40s and for those glory years and so each of them has a different way of relating to it. For Rory's character he's kind of trying to toss it in the trash bin because it it's something he couldn't live up to and it's essentially killed his father because his father couldn't live up to it whereas the Russian friends has completely um, idealized what America must have been in the 40s and so the Russian really falls in love with this incredible Adirondack camp, he falls in love with the lake he falls in in love with an idea with the idea but he also becomes uh, entranced with this matriarch who really is you know she's like a queen and carries herself like a queen and the sensuality of this character Charlie Sway being the matriarch of Sway Lake has uh, incredible power over the young men in different ways so putting these three characters in the same house and then with them um, Charlie Sway's maid who's played by Elizabeth Pena um, in what may have been her last role uh, you have four people living in this house all of whom have a very uncomfortable relationship with the past they all are essentially trying to either get back to some version of the past that they remember or think they should have deserved and therefore failing to live in the present and the story of the movie is a story of all four of the people in this house becoming present or at least beginning to understand or feel what the dance of being dancing with life must feel like and so the title of the song of Sway Lake is really about coming into flow and music is a part of it and connecting with the water is a part of it and all of that is in the title Mm -hmm. yeah since the house is so central to the story the house is you know this magnificent um place you know it's it's um i'm wondering how you came to find it or it find you i i how did you know Tell me the story, because it's, it's really, it's an impressive house. Well, you back to uh, the, Ari here. Actually, the house is on Blue Mountain Lake, which is which not... Is a, in uh, the Adirondacks. It's right. in the Adirondacks. The, the Sway Lake that we created for the film, which is this glamorous, expensive, private estate, is doesn't really exist but oh. there wa- there are these private lakes that do and the okay. house um, so it's an all an illusion it? it's all an illusion the house oh, actually like is nowhere near as glamorous <laughs> in real life that makes sense what do we want to say say it well we're, my brother and I are having a disagreement about the, about uh, It's not running. It's not on. <laughs> um, What's the problem? Just I can edit. I'm not going to put anything in here that uh, that's uncomfortable. I'll pause it. I'll pause it. Do we want to ask a question? Oh, okay. Here's the thing. The house is 
is is a it's an impressive thing. It's like you know, I hate this cliche that it's a it's a oh, its own character, but it, I mean, it really is is something that that creates a quite a mood and a vibe from a from the past. You know, this type of house, all wood and everything, and it's just you know, kind of lodgy. It, it, it may or may not be on the lake. Uh, I don't think it really matters that much to me. I don't care. I'm just trying to figure out. But just talk maybe in general then about where you shot it and how you created this appearance of this grand palatial house on this lake. If it runs against this idea of, that you created this illusion and you don't want to show the trick behind the illusion, that's fine too, but then talk about why you want to do that. Well, the house uh, was a lodge uh, rather than a private home for a long time. Uh-huh. It was um, built, I believe... Originally in 1910, then it burned down, then it was rebuilt in the 30s. The idea with the film was to create this sense that not just a house that could be big enough to be a lodge would be private, but also that the lake, which is not private in the film, is um, played as though it was a private lake that is now in the process of being kind of sold off piece by piece right, right, and right. become and it's becoming public and Mrs. Sway, Charlie Sway, the the matriarch is not happy with this place that was once her playground essentially now being filled with motorboats and and locals jet skis um, and, and jet skis and, and, and drunken, drunken and f- college kids and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, and she doesn't have anymore the liquid cash to um, run the place like she used to so taking a, a, a lodge and making it seem like a private home is a, is a fairly easy trick um, actually my previous film Adventures of Power there, were, there was a scene where I had to show that someone was a oil billionaire and so so it was with uh, my friend Adrian Grenier playing, a, oh, yeah. you know, like a um, Texan, a Texan air drummer, actually. But so the scene oh, saw that. inside his palatial home, we shot inside a library, <laughs> a beautiful library in Los Angeles that has, you know, marble floors and all of that. And so we made the library his living room. And then for the exterior, I shot a one of those gorgeous penthouse um, buildings on the corner of Central Park. So you look at the exterior and you say, sure. okay, imagine a, an apartment the size of a library on Central Park East, and suddenly you create the illusion that he's a billionaire. And yeah. we did that without spending any money. So these are the kinds of tricks that we do. But you didn't invent home. that idea. So no, no, no. I mean, it's, used, it's employed a lot and... Uh no, of course they didn't yeah. even. Yeah, so, so this is... Um, but to create the mythology, there were some other tricks we did in the, in the film. The film opens with a newsreel that looks like it comes from just after the war. And you have, you know, one of those announcers talking about the Sway right. family and Sway Lake and all this stuff. And, and we used a mix of archival footage yep. from the period, some stuff that we shot and colorized to look like it came from the newsreel, as well as some family footage of our grandparents wedding which uh, I found in a closet and uh, transferred it not knowing what it was and it's this beautiful wedding footage from the 40s which um, looked great so I didn't have to worry about clearing that because it was our family so using these kinds of things you can create a myth and it just has to be authentic you have to find a way to make sure that the illusion doesn't get broken and it's done so that's where talking about the illusion right can be right you know but i yeah. guess that's what we're doing here we're looking into the hood a of the bit. maserati right so so ethan uh are you, what's what's your what's your feeling about the protecting this the illusion um what is my feeling about protect- or what is do are you feeling protective of the illusion uh, <laughs> that you guys have created. Uh, I, I think I do feel protective of the illusion. I'm, I mean, maybe I'll revert to speaking as a composer. I, you know, uh, we were trying to uh, create authenticity uh, in the mm-hmm. past, but 
mm-hmm. a lot of what the you know the main character is trying to do is reconcile his extremely ambivalent feelings about the past he's looking he's looking towards it he's trying to protect it in a way it's what the film was about about kind of a uh unhealthy desire to protect the past uh the character of ollie sway is obsessed with these old records um but he's really not living in the present as a result of his obsession yes, with the old right, records and, and it's kind of yeah. metaphorically connected to what perhaps his father has his father has also suffered from this uh record collecting as as a pathology in a way um but it's a in a way a, an expression of their trying to hold on to you know the prior generations the, the greatest generations glories um but not knowing how to to integrate with the way the world is and the music of now and the attitudes of now the music of now you know that the the local girls on the lake listen to that's very much not music from the 40s and yeah and yeah, yeah. uh the and the the jet skis and the motor boating that yes, you know the right. kids of today are yes, doing yeah, doesn't yeah. doesn't jibe with the beautiful yeah. guide boats uh right. and so forth that the prior generations uh you know elegantly rode around the lake on so well you know it seems like if uh like if rory what's his character's name Ollie Sway. Ollie Sway, of course. Yeah. Ollie, of course. It seems that if Ollie, like a lot of people who are very steeped or have a deep nostalgic connection to their family's past or to the past in general, that if you embrace the new, you're rejecting the 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 past because you can't. It's hard to reconcile them both. Yeah. So you, so to turn your back on the past is is a really difficult thing to do for somebody like that especially if there's so much unfinished emotional business you know yeah there was a i mentioned there was a audience member in tucson who said something that was really interesting he he said that you know one of the things about that greatest generation uh, he was a guy i'm guessing in his 50s um so so his parents you know he's in a way talking about his parents but he said that those that generation really kept a lot of secrets um and that sense of that you're trying to you know you want to honor that thing as as this as ollie sway the character really wants to honor it but in his in a way he has doesn't really have any access to it yeah um he it, because of the kind of secretive nature of that generation and and the characters of the grandparents have these letters that they would write to each other which has a kind of it's like they have a secret language almost and the kids and certainly the grandkids don't really they can kind of worship it from afar but they're not really invited to the party uh so that so that even without any other you know neurosis that they might have developed there's a very um kind of conflicted uh connection with the past because they're looking up to it but they don't feel like they're part of it and they don't actually have any connection to it in terms of their daily life mm-hmm. the way the world looks now doesn't bear any resemblance to the world of of that time uh i'm passing the mic to ari yeah the the world war ii generation i, I think the the sort of sense that we have of them is that they they kept these secrets and it's interesting because having gone through that war which was so difficult and yet so from today's perspective so short from the Amer- on the american side you know yeah. you think about the wars that we go through now that go on for you know just go on and on and they're going on in the background but they this generation was victorious they were victorious after great sacrifice but then they came home and yeah they were keeping secrets and i'm not sure what that's about that's something that plays into the story because you hear these letters that charlie sway and commander hal sway have written to each other during the war and uh, brian dennehy plays the voice of hal sway and does that beautifully and they talk about the secrets and there is a secret that the young russian is obsessed with he's read in the letters that he's found in the attic about something called Eskimo Day Mm -hmm. which is a code between the um, between Charlie 
Charlotte's way and, and Hal's way, and he doesn't know what it means, and he wants to know what it means. He thinks it might be something to do with something that House Way was doing as a naval commander in the Pacific. Maybe it has something to do with the attempt to use wolf pack techniques in the in the Pacific, which was a kind of like gang of submarines that would um, block a convoy or protect a convoy. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it had something to do with sex and the way that they made love, you know. And he doesn't know, and he's wondering through the whole movie what Eskimo Day means. And I won't reveal whether or not it's revealed, but he <laughs> he does ultimately ask the Grand Mrs. Sway what it is, and uh, and it's interesting because people have picked up watching the movie the, the sense of secrecy and the, and I don't know maybe it ha- maybe it did have something to do with the war and the fact that for those four years that husbands were writing to wives they weren't allowed to say quote, what was going on you couldn't call from mm-hmm. a ship mm-hmm. um, and maybe they wrote in code for four years and then they got home in 1945 if they were lucky enough to come home and they still kept secrets and I know a lot of the people in that generation kept secrets from their children and the children who were born in the 40s then became the rebellious kids of the 60s and I think that was because they were sick of being lied to and sick of being left out of whatever great secrets their parents had I mean of course you know this is before our time, but right. but this was the sense I got, and this is what I tried to put into the movie. Hmm. It's you try to fit in a lot. It's occurring to me. Well, there's yeah, there's several generations of people on the lake, and though there there are very few characters, there all of this history is in that house, and it's in each of the people. Yeah, you know the the maid. Uh, yeah, Marlena. Gonna, that was going to be my next. Come question. from Cuba, uh, and there's played you, by Elizabeth you, Pena. Yeah, you hear about her having been rescued from Cuba and how her kids were left behind and how she started working for the family and Hal must have rescued her in some way and there is a unspoken implication that something happened with the maid and this is something that Elizabeth and I talked about that she may have had an affair with Mr. Sway or Commander Sway uh, during the period of her moving from Cuba to work for this family and so the symbiotic hatred between uh, Charlie Sway and her right hand has this history of maybe there was some sexual impropriety between them and it's not in the script and it's not something we told the other actors on set but the idea between Elizabeth and me was that she had uh, she and Hal had violated the trust of the matriarch and that history is also another secret that is in the house mm-hmm. you, you, you know we'll come back to Elizabeth in a minute but uh, it, like I said you, you have packed so much nuance you created clearly this universe of characters there's so much and whether it's all revealed in the film or not doesn't really really matter in the sense that you still created all these stories for these characters and I'm thinking man this should have been made into a serial serialized you know entertainment as opposed to a film because it's like there's so many stories you could be telling over a period of hours you know and you could have taken your time and divulged a lot more and created all these very nuanced relationships and hit this history you know usually well, people watching the film do say they don't want to leave they don't want to leave the world of the film yeah because yeah. part of it is the history and all these rich characters and the sense that you're just starting to understand how rich the story is as it ends but part of it also is just the sensuality of it the lake the the beautiful uh people swimming and the sense that everyone I think would like to at least dip for some of their life into the past and if you could jump into a time machine and 
be living with the most glamorous family on the east coast and their beautiful lake estate you probably would jump in that time machine so um but you know what i i also am a strong believer in catharsis and so structuring all of these tales into one you know hour and a half story is something that is a, a great challenge as a as a writer and director and something that you know i like i like the notion that it's enough to tell the story this story in in that amount of time and let let it percolate in your mind afterwards as I find that it does in the audiences we speak to where they'll you know write to me or Ethan a few days later and say how much they've been thinking about it and I was thinking about this character and I just realized XYZ or you know yeah, yeah it may be some of the audience is feeling that way but I think you're still hung up on it because you know you, you create a universe here's my thought you know as a, somebody who's creating a story out of nothing which you did right you're you're creating all these the plots the the character background all this history and it helps you create the world so it's very very believable you know and it something people can relate to and then you create the movie and then when you talk about the movie you generally talk about what people can see and you know and and what they're taking from it and it's a lot of the background stuff isn't really germane i mean to the experience of watching the movie it doesn't all have to come up you know what i mean it's like we're seeing this particular point in time where this you know these characters are together dealing with this particular you know period of their life and uh, but the reason i think you're still kind of you still caught up in the backstory that you know and all this so i'm thinking maybe he should be telling another story maybe a graphic novel maybe some <laughs> other means of telling everybody no, I think, it could work as a nice I mean, companion piece no then, i mean i'm i i i'm i love to answer questions about the backstory i know uh, it i was it, at your q a but, but the you know the truth is i think a great film like a great painting i mean you know a great painting you look at let's say it's a, a you know go uh let's say it's goya's What's it, 3rd of May, the, the one with the guy getting shot, executed? Okay, so there's that's one scene from that conflict. But when it's a great painting, there is an entire world that you can see around the painting, you know, on the, out, the outside of the... The frame. Uh, the frame. And for me, my favorite movies, um, like The Year of Living Dangerously was... The movie that made me want to make movies. No. That one, Mel Gibson plays a reporter who goes to Indonesia. Uh, Is that during, Peter Weir? Yeah, Peter Weir. Mm-hmm. During a very tumultuous time in Indonesia. And, you know, he tries to tell a, a uh-huh. story as a journalist and he falls in love with someone and they leave. Okay, so that's the surface story. But you see what's happening in Indonesia. You smell what's going on in the slums. You get this incredible sense of the giant world outside the frame of that canvas of that one movie and so that's something that I really aspire to do in my films is make a world big enough right. so that yeah, I when agree. the movie ends yeah, you yeah. feel it and when and you, you tell your piece it. of the story of that whole history and so you're telling a piece of it that you have a sense that there's so much more rich in richness. Oh, there's so much more going on that you know that you that exists there. It gives and a, it, you know a great right, actor like Elizabeth Pena understood that and understood yeah. we don't have to add a line about how she slept with Hal Sway. We right. just need no, no. To it's good that you didn't. It. Right, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Um, you don't want to overload it either because then the film can't breathe. You know what I mean? It well, needs that's to true. breathe. You know, because you're. It's just like, yeah. For as far as an audience experience, you want to feel like in terms of backstory. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, certainly backstory can be very, very hard to work with, and yeah. certainly in the editing room, we had a lot of um, challenges trying to figure out what should be revealed, what should be discovered through the film, and what should just be cut right. because it's uh, unnecessary information. And. But because this is a movie about people who are trying to reckon with the past, we had to include a fair amount of it. And, you know, right. the, the the story of the composer of the Song of Sway Lake itself, not the, the 
the actual composer Ethan Gold is sitting right next to me, but no, the but fictional the myth- one the mythology. in the movie, yeah. Yeah. we had to decide how much do we need to know about him. Okay, we know that he was Cole Porter's lover. We know that he recorded a song at the wedding that became a hit, but he never got rich off of it, and he died um, in obscurity. That was enough, but you know, I had a lot more detail about that character who never appears on screen. We just hear about him, which I wanted to include and ultimately had to just pull more and more information <clears throat> out sure. of the film and say, okay, it's not important. We know that he was a composer. We know that he died penniless. We know he wrote this song that is valuable and the secret version is very special to the family. Mm-hmm. And that's enough <laughs> because that de- those details alone actually do tell a lot of story and then you realize oh yeah Cole Porter that connects the family with the glamour of that of the jazz age and um, so but you know that was the challenge in the editing room to figure out what what information was too much information because I had versions where there was all this stuff about Tweed McKay and what had happened with him and you know where if he where he was allowed to sleep in the house and because if he's black and if he's bisexual maybe the family doesn't want you know him staying in the main house and you know these kinds of things that I was like okay it's great to think about that but maybe the audience doesn't need to know everything right it's a tip of the iceberg type thing we have to pay the toll, toll I mean on the highway. literally not we're right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all we all have to pay the toll in life yeah exactly at the toll booth of life yeah yeah you get the sound effects <laughs> The change, the uh, thank you. Thank you. It's only a matter of time. There, all the tobus are going to be gone. Place with that. With it, with it's the the scanner. The scanner. Yeah. I don't know that the world will mourn the loss of the toll booth necessarily as no, much. No, it's a uh, arcane idea. Like just make people stop on the highway to. But um, you know, they're just jobs that are lost. That's all. So let's talk a little bit about Elizabeth Pena, who plays Marlena in the film, because she's forgotten about. You know, I mean, it's like uh, well, she's like any, a she, she's very well remembered for the people who remember her. Well, and no, she, no, it's true. I she just feel was like really important to I think the yeah. you know, Cuban American community for sure. Uh, uh, filmmakers like John Sales used her all the time. Oh, that's and right, and he did talk about her on the show. I, I mean, I asked about her. So. Yeah, but it, it is, I mean, it's true in the sense that she's not a star, per se, and, but what a performer, I mean, and to, to. I mean, talking about that backstory of her affair with the, uh, the master of the house, she didn't want to add any lines about it, and in fact, throughout the rest of the film, she wanted to remove lines from this character, and there were so many act. most actors would try to get more lines yes, because they want right. to be sure. more central to the film. Right. And when we offered her the part, I was scared that the part was too small for her. Yeah. So it was a very rich part in my mind. There wasn't that much on the page. And then not only did she accept it, but then she said, let's take out more lines. She's moving towards being a silent film character. Let's push it further that direction. Let's make all of this history the loss of her ki- kids being left behind in Cuba, the the affair, the fact that she's essentially been a slave for decades of this rich family. Let's let it just be on her face instead of in the lines. And, you know, she does have still a fair number of lines in the film, but to remove lines, to have an actor ask me to remove lines was incredible. Yeah. And it was because she understood that her face could do it. And she knew her craft and she knew you know her instrument as actors say well enough to say that she could s- sing that melody just with her face just with her eyes and she does mm-hmm. and it's amazing what she does with her with her eyes in the movie um and in, you know it was a real honor for me to be able to work with someone of that caliber mm-hmm. um i have nothing bad to say about her i wouldn't <laughs> Wouldn't allow anything bad to go on the record here, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I remember one night she <laughs> she uh, 
sent a message through production because there were a fair number of days when she wasn't shooting and she was we had her staying in a cabin with a porch right on the water and she said she wanted to speak with me and she sent a message through production so after we finished shooting for the day I got in one of these guide boats from the 1890s and rowed across the lake under the moon to to her cabin and it was just like a summer camp mm-hmm. you know appointment between uh, lovers or something yeah, but yeah, anyway, yeah. I rowed up to her cabin and surprised her she was expecting someone to drop me off by car and she was sitting on the porch looking at the stars and that was when she it was her idea she suggested to me Mm -hmm. this notion of the past affair and she said you know there's something I'm reading in the script I don't know if you guys put it there deliberately but I feel like something happened with the husband and I said you could be right and she said I am right and are you cool with that and I said yeah I'm definitely cool with that and then I, w- I asked her, I said, you know, do you want to add a line to make it clear? And she said, no, 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 nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let me just do it. Mm-hmm. Let me just play it that way. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm. you know, I wish there were more actors like that. Or her. Hmm? Yeah, just her even. Yeah, I wish there was more her. I yeah. wish she was still with us. Yeah. Yeah. So you have more, some more festivals uh, lined up? Is that what you, you told me? Yeah, we're going to... Uh, a few more in the States coming up in the next couple of weeks and then Mallorca, Spain were the opening night film uh-huh. in Mallorca playing in the Royal, the I think the Royal Opera House it's called so it's going to be very glamorous mm-hmm. and I will be able to rent a scooter and buzz around the island which is something I've always wanted to do and then we'll see where else it goes with the festival season is kind of a rolling thing and we have a nice big festival invite in Europe for next summer so I think we're going to be on the road with the film for a while while we also work on our other things my brother Ethan will be coming when he can but he's also releasing a couple of records and so you know mm-hmm. he'll he'll be able to join when I beg him to mm-hmm. um, <laughs> because I think even though we do fight and if you had a visual you would see us sort of scowling at each other right now from the way we started the interview but um, I think even when we fight it's entertaining for an audience so it's good it's good for our Q&A yeah, no, sessions it wasn't really very dramatic or bloody I'm afraid not as we had one actually we were on the radio in Tucson and you can uh, tell me another time where it was more entertaining. We the fight got a little bit more heated. It actually uh-huh. almost became physical. Came but again, blows. that was radio. Yeah. So I think we should do a TV interview where we get in a fist fight, and then maybe we can compete with Oasis for uh, <laughs> right. you know brother versus brother gossip. Ethan, any any thoughts on this this idea? Um. We could have a fight about this. No, I don't. I, I don't. I don't particularly like playing it, <laughs> playing yeah. it as a marketing playing it up tool. for drama. No, uh, I agree. But you know, you can punch yourself if you want. <laughs> there we go. That's the kind of dialogue you want. <laughs> where? Let's see where we're at. I'm suggesting where, where? Ari punch himself. Uh, no, I. Uh, also, you know, mm-hmm. barbs are not as funny without that Northern English accent. Oh, sure, sure. That I, I have to agree with that. That's where Oasis... Uh, I am not going to, while tape is running, attempt that accent. Okay. We, we did a little... You and I, before tape was running, we were both... Yes. In a little cafe, I think, we were doing the northern That's right. thing. I'm just going to attempt one word. <laughs> so let's see. We're in Tuxedo Park, New York, right where 87 and 17 kind of converge, near Harriman State Park. So we're probably about, what do you think, about half hour, 40 minutes from the city? We are. I've actually shot in this region. Did you? Very close to here. Which which? Uh, I shot project? scenes from my film Helicopter, which is about the death of oh, our the mother. The oh. short film Helicopter oh, about our, our mother died in a helicopter crash with the rock music promoter Bill Graham. And she, she, she Say that again? My Our mother died... Now, I guess that's a big sentence. Our mother died in a helicopter crash oh. with the rock music promoter Bill Graham, who she was in love with, and they were possibly going to get married. 
He almost became your stepdad? He, I guess. Yes, I suppose he could have become our stepdad. But anyway, I made a short film about it called Helicopter, which Ethan did the music for as well, uh, and also did a, a major central theme song for that film. And we shot a scene faking at San Francisco in a town right near here, which is amazing, but we it does actually work. And we also shot a... I, I built a model set with a guy who lived right off this road. mm mm-hmm. um, who, well, he did most of the model building. I shouldn't take credit for it, but in order to shoot in San Francisco and create this, um, or to create the sense of San Francisco and to tell the story of us being stuck at this memorial concert for a celebrity rock music promoter who we didn't know very well, who our mother had died with, I wanted to create the sense that everything was not quite real and it was a mm-hmm. sense of, you know, three suddenly orphaned kids in shock. And so doing the, the memorial concert and the ride home from it with train set models was the way I decided to do it. And we, we built the train set models really just right off this road at this really? guy's house who... Um, was a designer and model builder and so uh, it's funny where do people find a helicopter helicopter is on my website if okay. you can you can go to ariegoldfilms.com slash helicopter and I'm bringing the film into potential development into a feature because uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky asked oh, right. me to do a psychomagic act which is a kind of shamanistic slash artistic slash psychological healing method that he developed where you act out a metaphor that or like a dreamlike metaphor that he comes up with for you to kind of resolve deep family trauma Mm. sometimes going back several generations Uh and so he asked me to dress as my mother and fly in a helicopter on the path that she died on and, and a few other things that were... Anyway, it's a fairly um, <laughs> shocking thing that's that like, I had to do. That's uh, like um, method acting taken to an all-new level. Well, I think the idea is that, you know, you dream metaphors mm-hmm. and you dream resolutions to things and you can dream them over and over and over again and not resolve them. But by actually doing them physically, yeah, doing very difficult things that he, he comes up with, you can heal not just yourself but the people around you and so it's been a side project for me for a couple years to pull off this psychomagic act where i you know fly on their on their path but not crash Uh, yeah it's a good (laughs) good choice so anyway i've recently completed the act but having filmed it i intend to turn the original short film helicopter as well as this act as well as who knows, perhaps some reenacted scenes from our childhood into a feature film um, because it's a story that continues to resonate for me and uh, for people who see the films and for, you know, this little, I did a little update on the Psychomagic Act and if anyone forgets, they can Google R.A. Gold Helicopter and I think you'll find, you'll find your way to, to the films which are online right now but I want to make a feature film that plays with this sort of like 32 ways of looking at Blackbird where it's a bunch of different takes on how we deal with death and how we we hold on to death and how we move on from death and, and the way that it affects our lives and you know it's a challenging thing to, to make art that is specifically about death and loss but uh, that's something that I'm very interested in, in doing more of just because it, it does seem to speak to people really well and it, I, I found that the first short film Helicopter had a great healing ability for audiences I, a lot of, I still get years later I get emails all the time out of the blue from people who say that you know I saw your film and I called my brother who I hadn't spoken with in 15 years for the first time your film made me realize that I have to hmm. reconnect with my family before we die 
and I get that a lot from this film. And huh. so, well, that's got to make it all worthwhile. Yeah, it makes it all worthwhile. Of, you know. I mean, you know, it's the same thing with as we've been touring with with this film. The, you know, when I get a woman in her seventies hugging me and saying thank you for showing the world how beautiful a woman of our age can be, you know, th- those yeah personal thank yous from an audience are lifeblood to me as an artist I know that some people say oh we shouldn't care what an audience thinks and you're not making a film for an audience I, I don't subscribe to that point of view and for me it's it's a communication and if sure. I'm just making art and I don't care what people think about it then you know I might as or, well be doing it in my bathtub right and you don't get that out of the business side of it so this is really you don't important. get the business side of it yeah, no yeah yeah uh, hey, and Ethan, uh, what do you, what do you, what's your feeling about the uh, helicopter reenactment, and um, where where are you at in that whole well, I'm, project? In terms of, I'm not, uh, you know, I did the music for Ari's short helicopter and uh, contributed dialogue in the form of having lived through the experience, and and you know, he has somebody in that original short playing me saying things that I actually said at the time. Um, and uh, but you know I, this is that's Ari's path. I I yes. don't personally seem to want uh, you know want to uh, interesting to yeah. you know it's something that he's doing. I I I was present in the room when he was doing his Skype uh, conversation with with uh, Jodorowsky, um, and uh, encourage my brother to do what he feels is right personally uh, and artistically and I will contribute if um, you know Mm -hmm. he would like me to to score that Uh, you know we'll we'll have that conversation and um, uh, you know but I I I, kind of leave that to to his to my brother's journey artistically and personally that's his way it's not my way (laughs) so but I I, it's cool and I, I I get it where do Which people? Interesting. Jod- I actually asked Jodorowsky is, uh, about Ari Ethan. Again. Yeah, sorry, I just mm-hmm, took sorry. the mic from Ethan. Um, when he suggested the act, I said, "Do you think because he, you know, does this not just for personal healing but for family healing?" I said, "Do you think my brother and sister should come in the helicopter with me?" And he said, "No, this is your journey. This is not their journey." And then he paused for a second. He said, "But you could bring your father." And he brought that up out of the blue. Huh. And it was kind of interesting because he, I think, sensed a little bit what Ethan just said, that this artistic and personal exploration into our mother's death and the shock that it put on our systems is something that I'm dealing with. But he, I, think, I think he intuited that it's also something that our father needed some healing from, too, and that was that was pretty interesting. And so I didn't bring our dad in the helicopter, but I included him in the ritual. Where the ritual in- included the releasing of a bird, and so I had um, I had our dad meet us at the top of the mountain to release the bird with me. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting too because he looks a lot like Jodorowsky, <laughs> so it's almost like Jodorowsky is up there with with me yeah, on yeah. the top of the mountain. But has Jodorowsky been a long time? Uh, I don't meaningful to you, this man. What'd you say? Did, has Jodorowsky been uh, meaningful to you for a long time? You know, I haven't had a long time obsession with him. Some people are obsessed with him. Uh, to me, he's a great artist and a great thinker and a prankster in some ways and somebody who's mm-hmm. constant desire to do what is right for him is inspiring and in that he's never he's never done anything but be Jodorowsky so I don't want to be a Jodorowsky because I'm not Jodorowsky but he's a good um, reminder to be yourself as an artist and yeah. as a person mm-hmm. and also I am very inspired by the fact that he, at his age now, late 80s, is producing some of what I think to be some of his best work, going deeper into his soul, going deeper into his heart, and challenging himself in many decades after a lot of artists have kind of given up doing that. Mm -hmm. And that is 
amazing to me and, yeah. and super inspiring to me. So, so yeah, that's, that's that. Uh, Ethan, wh- how do people find your music and... Um um well there's yeah. there's uh the the intro nettos um i'm on <laughs> my name's my name is ethan gold i'm on uh i have a website which is surprisingly ethangold.com uh i have a record out mm-hmm. uh, i have a soundtrack out i have a whole bunch of music kind of uh in the on deck circle um i have a whole bunch of videos on youtube channel um youtube am i really doing this giving my <laughs> youtube dot you com to, slash you, think, you know i have all the social networks i'm on yeah. pretty much all the social networks it's either depending if i could get ethan gold or it's ethan gold music if i couldn't get ethan gold uh in a couple cases there are other ethan golds who nabbed those before i could um and uh you can find my music and my videos and mm-hmm. uh, uh, but actually stuff from a few years ago i've been sort of silent to the world for a few years i had a injury and was not putting stuff out for a few years but i'm actually been developing a lot of new music i just haven't been right uploading uh, it or whatever been, yeah, yeah releasing yeah. but things things are uh, there there things are in motion right now actually behind okay. the scenes so good. Yeah. good excellent so you can see my work from a few years back and, 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 and anticipate and the yeah yeah that, which which is actually quite a bit yeah the stuff that i put out was whatever i i've evolved Mm-hmm. So, but I stand by it. But it's a, I'm in a different space from from there. Understood. Uh, thank you for asking. Sure, sure. Well, I'm interested. All right, well, guys, I think we're good. Hey. All right. Hey. Uh, it's a. Uh, <laughs> um, ver- okay. Ari's Ari's wants the mic. Here it goes. Should I give my social media too? Is that the is that the world we're living in? Or is that all on the side? Sorry. Should I also do social media? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so Ari Gold, at Ari Gold is me. Ari Gold Films is my website. My films are there. A bunch of the videos that I've done for Ethan are on my website as well. So you can um, find both of us through that. And swaylake.com is the movie. And you can watch the trailer there and see this beautiful lake. Part of it real and part of it mythological right there on your own screen thank you thank you thank you it was great meeting you guys up in Woodstock and grateful yeah. for the opportunity to uh, to have the ride back with you guys yeah I was going to say that I didn't want I left you to make that joke grateful for having the opportunity to 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 ride with you speaking into the back of my head <laughs> yeah, I know it's been a little awkward but thanks to the clown mics that we've got, yeah, bring it, bring it all the way back home. You take the right. The, you can take the little red Thank ball you. off and put it on your nose. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. I should buy a, like a bunch of these and make it a, like a giveaway, right? If, this has been <laughs> <laughs> Ethan Gold and and Ari Gold. Yeah, and this has been Film Wax Radio. Thank you, guys.